Okay, so the seminar which you're about to see is entitled Environmental Effects of Oxide Nanomaterials. This was actually given at the European MRS meeting in the spring 2015 in Symposium V. And I, at the very outset, I actually want to thank um, the students and my collaborators who were actually involved in the presentation. Uh, I'm going to actually talk about some terbium dope cerium phosphate nanostructures, a work had, that had been performed by Fen Zhang. I'm actually going to talk also about some toxicity studies, and in order, I'm going to actually speak about TiO2 materials, uh, which had been performed by Jingyi Chen, um, zinc oxide structures performed by Zhao Weipeng in collaboration with the group of Nicholas Fisher and Sun Estonian Brook, uh, the Marine Sciences Department, and lastly, on tongue state nanoparticles uh, using materials that had been initially developed by Fen Zhang, and these studies um, were also developed with... Um, with the aid of John Patet, uh, Chris Koningsman, and Crystal Lewis um, at Stony Brook. And we did this in, co in collaboration with Kathleen Dunnick and also with um, Steve Leonard's group at NIOSH. So I hope you enjoy um, th this work. And you know, uh, the importance of toxicity is of, na of nanomaterials in general is quite important because number one, these are very rarely studied. But if we're going to ever use nanomaterials in a ubiquitous way, we actually need to understand the nature of how these nanomaterials interact with various environmental, um, environmental uh, types of contexts, whether it be in marine environments, whether it be um, in cellular environments and the like. So uh, the implications of this, th these sorts of studies are quite critical if we're going to try to develop viable applications of nanomaterials in, in the future. So um, I'm going to talk about environmental effects of oxide nanomaterials. And just to start off as to why this was important to us at the very beginning, I'm going to mention that our group actually works on synthesizing and making oxide materials. So as an example, we were creating chemically doped rare earth phosphate nanowires for bioimaging a few years ago, and the idea was that we had the ability to make two different types of morphologies using a room temperature template directed technique, so we were able to make both high purity, high aspect ratio, single crystal and ultra thin wires, as well as nanowire bundles. And the point is, is that we could actually make ultra thin nanowires on a reasonably large scale. And the second thing was that these terbium dope cerium phosphate nanowires for the purpose of biology exhibited a redox switchable green photoluminescence that could be used for biological labeling purposes. So the nanostructures were not only biocompatible with cells, but were also relatively non-toxic over reasonable time periods and concentrations, which is relevant for biology. So uh, what I'm showing you here is an X-ray diffraction pattern showing that the terbium dope cerium phosphate nanowires that we make are actually very similar to what you would expect for, for the bulk. And moreover, if you were to look at it from an electron microscopy point of view, what we actually form are a number of isolated types of wires, a single crystalline, the fraction pattern is quite sharp, and we can make, again, large quantities of these wires. Now, for the purposes of biology or biolabeling, what is significant about this is that these particular materials, upon excitation of 256 nanometers at room temperature, exhibit a degree of re reversible switching. So what I mean by that is that we can switch on their luminescence by reducing with ascorbic acid. We can switch them off by oxidizing using potassium to permanganate. And the broadband that you see here can be ascribed to the 5F to 4F transition to cerium 3+ where the excited state of cerium 3 plus is not necessarily completely quenched by energy transfer to the terbium uh, 3, 3 plus material. And that, again, of importance for biology, if you were to successively um, subject these wires to redox cycles, they're going to maintain their structural integrity. Okay, so um, the purposes of biolabeling, what we can see is that the confocal fluorescence microscopy images show you that we actually are able to incorporate these particular terbium dope cerium phosphate wires, 37 degrees Celsius, 
into these cells at concentrations of 0.2 milligrams per mil, so that if you compare A and B, the confocal luminescence images exactly overlap with the optical uh, images such that at 37 degrees Celsius, you can see that there is, there is reason to believe that these structures can be used for a labeling type of application. Now, when we're thinking about using nanowires, nanostructures for biological applications, one of the considerations is, of course, whether or not these wires are going to be toxic or not. And one thing that you could see here is that if you incubate these particular nanowire cells, even after five redox cycles, you still have a relatively good amount of activity, um, which is good. See, so it's just even after five uh, periods of, of five redox cycles, and this is at concentrations of 0.5 milligrams per mil, up to periods of about two to 24 hours, and that the cell viability is maintained to about 80% even after two days, even at concentrations, again, of as high as 0.5 milligrams per mil. So what this basically illustrates and shows you is that number one, these wires can be used as a bio-labeling bio type of, 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 of application. And secondly, it's not necessarily toxic to cells, which is good. And these preliminary studies enabled us or allowed us to think about uh, the, the idea of investigating the cytotoxicity of these particular structures in a much more systematic fashion, a much more systematic way. And what we're going to talk about for the rest of the presentation are examples of nanostructure toxicity and looking at various types of, of systems with respect to that topic. So the very first one I want to refer to are TiO2 or titania nanostructures. And one of the things that we did is to look at the set of toxicity of, for instance, 0D nanoparticles, 1D nanorods, 3D assemblies of TiO2. TiO2 is useful for a number of different applications, whether it be for batteries, whether it be for, for photonics, gas sensors. And the bottom line that I want to highlight is that all of these particular nanorods could actually be used for um, labeling, could be internalized into these cells, often at concentrations of 125 micrograms per mil, and that only the um, idea of cytotoxicity occurred when you irradiated these structures with UV light. So for instance, you irradiate for about energies of one joule per centimeter squared, um, then you observe some degree of mortality, 60% mor mortality rates, but otherwise um, you don't really see any toxicity if you simply incubate these structures with, with the TiO2. So we actually, um, our lab makes things, makes structures, so we were actually able to make nanoparticles uh, that, for instance, the spherical nanoparticles here measure, have diameters of 12 plus or minus 2 nanometers. Again, single crystalline spherical TiO2 particles. We're actually all also able to make TiO2 nanowires that have diameters of 80 nanometers and lengths of a few microns, single crystalline. Again, we can make them in relatively large quantities through a hydrothermal process. And also, we can make three-dimensional structures. So for instance, three-dimensional three micron scale assemblies annotates TiO2. And again, every single case that you see, the constituent nanowires to these three-dimensional assemblies are also single crystalline in and of themselves. So we make different morphologies, different sizes, different diameters. We expose the entire class of 0D, 1D, as well as 3D structures to TiO2. And the 3D structures have that outer di overall diameters of one micron, inner diameters of about 100 to 200 nanometers, and we expose all of these nanowires to cells. And the whole point of it is that if you look from A to B to C to D, all of those particular panels, what you, what you see is that you don't really have any degree of toxicity unless you irradiate with, a, with about one joule per centimeter squared. And then you do see some toxicity, especially with nanorods and 3D nanostructures at high concentrations. So it is the process of irradiation which induces toxicity. And the reason that we can observe this is that if you look at, for instance, these bar graphs, what you notice is that only when you have UV irradiation for about a minute, you actually have a, a, a signal due to the fluorescent compound, which is sensitive to the presence of reactive oxygen species, such as hydroxyl, such as peroxy, 
superoxide anion singlet oxygen H2O, H2O2, only when you have UV irradiation is, does that fluorescent compound evince some intensity? Does it give forth to some intensity, which you can see on each of the right-hand uh, bar graphs of each of these pairs of bar graphs, okay? So what this implies, again, is that if you don't irradiate with UV light, this is good, this is good for labeling. So if you have CiO2, what you could envision is that you could hook up a fluor fluorescein isothiocyanate directly onto the surface of TiO2. So what I'm showing you on the, on the far right are these confocal images of these FITSI labeled TiO2 nanorods. And what you see on the left are characterizations showing you that in fact I do have these dye molecules labeled onto my TiO2. The point of it is that these particular nanorods can be used to label these particular cells, whether I use 1D, whether I actually use these um, nanorods and nanoparticles. And these white arrows here point out to areas where I'm actually um, showing you where these TiO2 nanorods have actually gone right into the cells. And slices 4, 5, and 6, the middle slices on the right-hand side, show you the TiO2 nanorods have actually become incorporated within the internal part of the cell because what I'm doing is a cross-section through the particular cell so these nanowires are internalized in, within that particular cell itself, not on the surface, but within that particular cell. So it's the same thing for the um, nanoparticles, which you see on top, and the 3D micron scale assembly. So all the green structures that you see highlight the TiO2, which has been incorporated within these particular HeLa cells. So again, what I've shown you is one example of TiO2, and it shows you that the morphology um, does make a difference, but it's more important whether you irradiate this, this with, with UV light or not. The second example I want to highlight are actually zinc oxide nanostructures. And zinc oxide nanostructures, there's a lot of words here, but what I want to emphasize, what I want to stress, is that it's not only the presence of dissolved zinc ions which make a difference, but it's also the nanoparticles morphologies which make a difference as well. So both particle concentrations and morphologies will affect the growth of the zinc oxide particle. All right, so zinc oxide is actually useful because it's used in sunscreen, ceramic dye coatings. Uh, marine diatoms are useful for, uh, for global carbon fixation. And many people have tried to understand whether or not it's the particle concentration or the particle size which is significant, which is important for the, the toxicity of the zinc oxide. In other words, whether it is the morphology, whether you have intercellular accumulation or di dissolution, which renders zinc oxide to be toxic or not. Okay, so um, one of the things that we, we did was in very much analogy to TiO2, we actually made spherical particles of zinc oxide, large spherical particles, nanorods, nanoneedles of zinc oxide. So small spheres, large spheres, nanorods, and nanoneedles, okay, of zinc oxide. And then we tested their, their uh, dissolving abilities in this aqueous media. And as you can see on the far right-hand side, what is highlighted in, in blue is that we do have a good saturation concentration of small spheres versus nanorods, and that you do have more zinc oxide or zinc, dissolved zinc, associated with small spheres as compared to the, nano, to the nanowires and nanoneedles. But the point which I'm going to highlight is that it's not necessarily the amount of dissolved zinc which is responsible for the toxicity that you measure. Because we do see actually larger amounts of zinc ascribed to small spheres compared to the nanoneedles, but it turns out the nanoneedles are more toxic than the small spheres. Okay, so um, we also look at the constant, whether or not this is, this is dependent on the morphology. The same idea that the dissolution rates are actually going to be independent of particle concentration. You always get a certain level of saturation of concentration of zinc, which is independent of, of morphology. And the bottom line is that we exposed, again, all of the zinc oxide I showed you earlier. So all of these four structures to the three diatoms, which I'm showing you here, of different biomass, of different shapes, different chemistries. So the, what's important is that the last one, P. trichornitin, shows slightly less 
silicified outer walls compared to the other two species. So the chemistry of the bottom one is different from the other two above, all right? So um, what we know is that zinc oxide is going to be toxic to the uh, P. C. C. pseudonona as well as P. gracile, but for P. triconeosum, you do see some degree of a dependence of how much zinc actually affects the overall toxicity, and it turns out that P. triconeosum can more easily meet its cellular silicon requirement as compared to the other diatoms, which explains the varying behavior that we see relative for, for one relative to the other two alkyl species. So if you were to focus just simply on P. triconeosum, which is the one on the far right, what we notice is that if we summarize the degree of alkyl growth, we notice that first the cell division rate decreases with increasing particle concentration for all the particle types. Number two, that you actually have the, the one-dimensional zinc oxide. So what I've circled in red is actually more toxic than, than the spheres. And that third, there's a morphology effect whereby if you increase the zinc oxide concentration, you get more toxicity. So is the toxicity ascribed to zinc oxide alone? The reason, the answer is no. And it's because of the fact that you have more zinc oxide species relative to the small spheres relative to the nano needles, but the nano needles are more toxic than the spheres. So the morphology is more highly responsible. It's more going to, it's going to be more of a factor. And how we know this is that you have a mechanical breakdown of the cells and the release of the zinc ions potentially disrupting the, the, the uh, trace metal absorption and uptake, and the nanoneedles and nanowires that we see, especially in panel A, they will absorb, they will incorporate into these marine algal species much more readily compared to small spheres and, and these other large spheres. So the morphology plays a, a, a difference in this particular case. So I guess the bottom line, which I also want to stress, is that there's a lot of different factors that are responsible for, for toxicity. It's not simply a matter whether we're dealing with TiO2, whether we're dealing with zinc, or zinc oxide. Morphology also plays a big difference as well. And so the last example I want to highlight uh, in this particular case are tungstate nanostructures. And just to, 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 just to give a little bit of an aside, our group focuses on making materials with high sample quality, crystallinity, and purity with control over size, shape, and monodispersity. And essentially what we try to do is to, is to um, create structures using the, the guidelines highlighted in blue. In other words, non-toxic precursors, aqueous solvents, little of any byproducts, ambient temperature and pressure with the possibility of scale up. And so um, in very similar terms, what I showed you for making terbium dope, cerium phosphate, we were actually able to make nanowires of barium tungstate and barium chromate, and these structures are useful for um, medical lasing applications, for instance, for barium tungstate. Barium chromate is useful for photocatalysis. Uh, so for barium um, tungstate, what we actually have, again, using a YouTube methodology, whereby we actually have a one aqueous solutions of barium um, a chloride or barium nitrate on the one hand, sodium tungstate, sodium chromate on the other. You allow these two solutions to diffuse, interact within a U-tube cell. What you end up forming is actually a um, nanowires of barium tungstate, barium chromate within the template pores. You process these particular pores, you get a raise or you get isolated wires of tungstate or chromate. So again, very similar to what I showed you in the very first case study of phosphate, you actually were able to get these particular wires. And what I'm showing you here is a cross section down the middle of that particular membrane. So you actually get these filled nanowires. You don't get any other type of morphology. And so this is a this is ambient, room temperature, no seeds, no surfactant way of being able to make really usable and useful tungstate wires that are single crystalline, that are pure, for which we don't have any impurities per se. And the bottom line is that we can control the composition using this ambient technique so that we can go from barium tungstate all the way to strontium tungstate, everything in between. We can make wires in large quantities. We can make wires of good defined 
uh, chemical composition and, and control. And we can, again, the, the, the strontium tungstate, the barium tungstate species series, rather, as well as the calcium tungstate, the strontium tungstate series. And so when we, again, in a very similar type of strategy to the zinc oxide as well as TiO2, we expose a wide range of these metal oxide species to um, different types of, of structures, so the, the different types of cells, rather. So what we have here, we're testing both for chemical composition as well as testing for morphology, and they have a variety of different sizes here. And as you saw earlier, with both TiO2 and with zinc oxide, it's not necessarily the size which is going to make that, that, that difference. But every metal oxide system is different. Every system is going to have its own effects. And what we did was we actually tested these particular structures. We exposed these particular structures to macrophages. And what we saw in that particular uh, case was that it turns out that with these structures, if we expose them to these um, macrophage cells, both the spheres and the wires show you that we do have decreased cellular viability after about one day of treatment. So the wires tend to seem to be more toxic than, 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 the, than the spheres, but none of these are as toxic as chrome-6, okay? All right, so um, again, we expose these particular structures to a, a variety of different, we have different compositions. We expose them to, to um, spheres as well as to wires. And what you show here at the bottom is that you have more association between these nanowires versus these particular cells, all right? And the, t and the electron microscopy highlights the fact, the electron microscopy shows you that again, we do have a lot more of these particular um, wires which are embedded within these macrophage cells. Okay, so what do we know in terms of ROS? So if you look at an acellular environment versus a cellular environment below, both types of nanoscale, nanoscale tungstates will produce hydroxyl radicals, but the bottom line is that the um, wires produce more hydroxyl radicals versus the, the spheres. So both of them are toxic to some extent, but this is, this is a much more convoluted, a much more complicated situation because these tungstates don't necessarily give you cellular H2O2, which would be toxic in and of itself. This is not giving you H2 hydrogen peroxide even at concentrations of 50 micrograms per mil for five minutes or exposures for, for one hour. So it's not H2O2, which is the, the, the um, reason for the toxicity. What you do see is that, again, the wires give us some degree of ROS production even after five hours for all of the tungstate nanowires. And again, the, the idea is that the wires which are below show you more toxicity relative to the spheres which you see uh, above. So again, there's a high level of toxicity re relative to the wires for, for the wires relative to those of the spheres. But the, nano, na the tungstate na particles do not necessarily result in oxidative DNA damage as compared to, for instance, chromium-6, which you see below. So what, what I, I think that the point is, is that even though the tongue states do show some ROS, the ROS is minimal. The ROS amount is such that it's manageable. And I think that what we want to highlight is that even after about two days, three days, the level of toxicity, the level of cell viability is such that um, it's as if the cells become used to, accustomed to the idea of having tongue state nanowires or particles within them. All right, so in terms of, of an overall summary for the tongue states, the, the, what we show is the MTT assays show decreased cellular viability at about for 24 hours, and that the intercellular ROS assay shows increased but relatively mild ROS production in wire exposed cells as compared to, to the controls no significant ROS reduction in spheres of exposed cells, and that only the wires produce hydroxyl radicals under cellular and acellular conditions. The spheres primarily produce hydroxyl radicals under acellular conditions, and that the, the tungstate particles are not necessarily toxic, but that the wires are more reactive than the spheres and have initial manageable toxic effect on the cells such that, at least for the tongue states, both the shape and the size play a major role in, in, in determining the overall reactivity 
and in this particular case, vary the chemical composition and variability does not necessarily yield um, extreme differences in terms of, of, these, of this particular toxicity. And with that, I'm going to conclude because I'm over time and just really thank the individuals who were involved with these studies. And more specifically, I want to thank my collaborators, at least on, on, on the bio work. And these were um, Steve Leonard at NIOSH and Nick Fisher, uh, who helped us with the marine studies at Stony Brook. And with that, I want to thank my funding agencies, um, DOE, NSF at the, at, in, in the United States. I want to thank um, all of these individuals for technical assistance. I want to thank you for all of your attention. Thank you very much.